a witness. A witness is one who gives a testimony of what they saw, what they heard, or what they experienced. Throughout history, God has always had a witness. Never been a time when someone who stood for him was not involved in the world. Now, being a witness for God is not often easy. Think back. Many of the prophets, Jesus himself, and most of the apostles were all put to death because of being a witness for the one true God. Why? Well, people don't like the message. People don't like to be told our natural self is that we can't work our way into heaven. There's nothing we can do to earn God's favor. God has done it for us. And we must turn, we must repent and trust the object of our faith today is the Lord Jesus Christ. Put our faith and trust in him and him alone to save us from our sins. That is not a popular message, folks, in case you don't know it. But we shouldn't be surprised. Jesus himself said in John 15, 18, if the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. I mean, think about that. Jesus was hated. Did he ever do any one thing to any person? No. Everywhere he went, every person he met, he was always kind and gentle. Of course, he did rebuke the self-righteous Pharisees, but that, that needed to be done. But Jesus, everything he did, he went about doing good, yet he was opposed and rejected. Why? Because of his message. His message that you must repent of your sins and believe in me. So when, when you are a witness for Christ, you take a stand for Christ, it's not often easy. You will draw the world's hatred, but at the same time, there's great reward. First of all, the reward that you are being used as one of his instruments. Second of all, you have eternal rewards that no amount of suffering on this earth will never be able to touch. So today I want to talk about God's witnesses. From Revelation chapter 11, we're going to look at in the future two witnesses that God had, and to me, two of the more interesting people in the whole Bible. Now remember, this is the tribulation period that's taking place on planet Earth. Seven years, the worst time that mankind will ever know, a time of judgment, a time of wrath. The first three and a half years that we saw will be a time where things will be bad, but not as bad as they, they will get in the future. Because after this three and a half years, we saw this in Daniel chapter 9, 24 to 27, there's this man of, of sin, we call him the Antichrist, the lawless one. He's going to go into the temple in Jerusalem and claim to be God. So that last three and a half year period is going to be a period that the world has never known before. So in this tribulation period, there were, we've seen seven seal judgments, and then there's going to be seven trumpet judgments. We've looked at six so far. Beginning in Revelation chapter 10, verse 1, there's this interlude. There's this break in the judgments upon the earth. And today we're going to see in chapter 11, verse 3 through 14, two witnesses are introduced. Two witnesses. We're going to see their power, their death, and their resusc resuscitation. Their power, chapter 11, verse 3. And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. Who grants this authority? Either God the Father or God the Son, Jesus Christ. These two witnesses, the dynamic duo, I mean, Batman and Robin on steroids. They have often two witnesses together in the Old Testament. Moses and Aaron. Joshua and Caleb, Elijah and Elisha. And so these two witnesses will be uniquely anointed by God, protected by God, given his power and authority to speak to the world, to speak to the earth of judgment that's coming 
and that they must repent and turn back to Jesus Christ. Now, when we see that word witness, we get our English word today, martyr. A martyr, as you know, is one who's proved the strength and genuineness of their faith in, in Christ by undergoing death instead of renouncing their faith. So let me talk about these two witnesses, a few things about them. What, how, when, who, and why. What did they do? Well, they prophesy, it tells us. Now, in pro- when we see that word prophesy in the New Testament, it doesn't always mean that you proclaim the future. Usually what it means is to speak forth, to proclaim, to preach. What were they prophesying? What were they preaching? Well, I believe it was the same message that Jesus preached the first time he came. Matthew 4, 17, it says, and Jesus began his public ministry and said, repent for the kingdom of God is near, is at hand. Repent, change your mind. The kingdom is near because the king is here. Jesus was there. He's calling the nation of Israel to himself. Of course, the nation rejected him. And now he's going to come back a second time, literally to set up a kingdom. And so I believe these two witnesses are telling the world now, the earth now, the same message that Jesus had. Repent. Jesus is coming back soon. The kingdom's going to be established. How, how are these witnesses clothed? They're clothed in sackcloth. Sackcloth was this coarse material that people would wear in the Old Testament, an outward demonstration of inner mourning or grief. And so I believe that these two witnesses have this sackcloth on because of the sorrow of the world that the world continues to reject God in his love, God in his grace and mercy. When are they going to do this? Well, it says 1,260 days, literal days, three and a half years. Again, um, as we've gone through Revelation, I've often said the different views that people have, commentators differ on, is this going to be the first three and a half years of the tribulation, 1,260 days, or the second three and a half? I don't believe it's going to be the second because... The second, it wouldn't give enough time for the judgments. I believe this is the first part of the tribulation. When the temple is being built, remember there's going to be a temple that's going to be built in Jerusalem. I believe it's going to be a, it will be a peace treaty that this person, the Antichrist, will, will involve the world with. And as this peace treaty, as the temple gets close to rebuilding, the, the Antichrist, once it's done, is going to break the treaty. I believe at this point is when he's going to come out in his full clothing, who he really is, and these two witnesses will be put to death, as we'll see in a moment. So the big question is often, who are these guys? Who are these two guys? Well, two things. First of all, they're two men. All the pronouns that are used, they, these, them, are all masculine pronouns. Second, what is their identity? I mean, there's there's so many people who differ on this. One, one view says that these aren't two literal people. They're just symbolic. Well, I don't believe that. They're two real people. Why? Because we're going to see they're going to die, and they're going to be resuscitated. They're going to be brought back to life. Literal people. Others say that these are, are two men, but we don't know who they are. And that's possible. Others say that these are two Old Testament characters, Enoch and Elijah. Why those two? Well, because Enoch and Elijah are two men in the Bible who never died. Enoch in Genesis chapter 5, there's a genealogy there, and then the genealogy said, and then he died, and he died, he died, on and on and on. Then all of a sudden you come to Enoch, and I think it's Genesis 5:24, it says, and Enoch walked with God, and he was no more. In contrast to everybody else who died, Enoch He just walked right into heaven one day. He never tasted death. And then, of course, Elijah. Elijah didn't die either. Chariot of fire came and swooped him up and brought him into heaven. So many people believe that this is Enoch and Elijah, but I don't think it fits the best because Enoch doesn't do the miracles that we're going to see in a second. A and B, Enoch was a Gentile. Enoch was around before God called Abraham. So I don't think it's going to be Enoch and Elijah. The fourth one that most people say it is, and I would agree with it, is Elijah and Moses. Why those two? Well, as we'll see in verse 6, the miracles and the judgment that these two witnesses 
carry out were the same kind and type like Elijah and Moses did. Second thing, uh, when Jesus is transfigured on, on, on the mount, Matthew 17, Peter, James, and John are with him. His clothing, it says, was as white as snow. His face was like the sun. Who shows up there with Jesus? Elijah and Moses, representing the prophet Elijah and the law, Moses. Uh, I think a third thing, um, uh, Malachi chapter 4, the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi. I think some people call it Italian, call it Malachi, but Malachi is the <laughs> proper pronunciation. It says, before the great and terrible day of the Lord, Elijah is going to come. Fast forward to Jesus' ministry. And the apostles were asking Jesus about John the Baptist. And Jesus says, he came as Elijah did. Well, the point he was making there, John the Baptist came not literally as Elijah, but in the spirit and power of Elijah. So Elijah still has to come in the future. So I think for sure one is Elijah. The one who's doubtful is possibly Moses, because Moses died, unlike Elijah and Enoch. But Moses' body was hid, Deuteronomy chapter 34 says, so, so that the Israelites could not make a shrine of it, could not worship it. So anyway, here's the bottom line. God doesn't tell us who they are. So spec speculation is fun, but it's pretty futile. If he, would, if he wanted us to know who they were, he told us, but it, it is interesting. But here's the most important thing about these two witnesses. Why did they come? The reason they came is because God always has a witness. Even at the end times. Not just them. Chapter 7 of Revelation, we saw 144,000 Jewish born-again evangelists who are going to be going out in the world speaking. Now God's going to add another two to their number. And the whole world is going to see these two men. And verse 4 says, these are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. These two men are symbols representing God. This goes back to the prophet Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 4, when they were trying to rebuild the temple. And there were two men of God, Zerubbabel, who was the political leader, and Joshua, who was the high priest. And these two men helped establish the Jews back in Israel. They helped rebuild the temple. And they were called olive trees. Olive tree, uh, oil that comes out of it, is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. So these two men in the Old Testament, Zerubbabel and jo uh, Joshua had this, so will these two men in the future. And they are lampstands, that is, light-bearing witnesses. And so these two men in the future will be similar to Zerubbabel and Joshua. God's going to use these two. He's going to protect these two men for 1,260 days. Now, I mentioned four men to you. Zerubbabel, Joshua, possibly Moses and Elijah. Here's what we have in common with these men, everybody here. All true witness must be done in the power of the Spirit. God calls us today. We are his witnesses. And to be his witnesses is not my clever words, your good arguments. The main thing about a witness is that we are doing it with God's power speaking through us. We have that power in us. First of all, it comes from the gospel. The good news that Christ died for sins and was buried and rose from the dead. Romans 1.16, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God to all who believe. The power of God, the word power is where we get our word dynamite from. So this dynamite is the gospel, the good news of Christ. Furthermore, the Holy Spirit now indwells every believer. So this this truth that God always has a witness. 
He always has people who have the spirit in them. He always has people who are lampstands, whose light shines before the world that needs to see it. It's not our intelligence, how good of debaters we are, but it's how much the spirit has of our life and how we're walking with Jesus or not. We'll get back, get back to that in a little later. So these two men will be mocked, cursed, and attacked. But it will not go well for their attack, is verse 5. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire flows out of their mouth and devours their enemies. So if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this way. These have the power to shut up the sky so that rain will not fall during the days of their prophesying. And they have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every plague as often as they desire. Whoa, so these two men will control the weather. They'll turn water to blood. They'll strike the earth with plagues. Who's that reminiscent of? Moses and Elijah. You go back, and that's exactly what those those two men did. And they have God's power, the word authority. All this comes from God. Not on their own. They're God's mouthpiece. They're God's witnesses. So here we see their power. But now... The world's going to get the best of them. We'll see their death. Verse 7. When they had finished their testimony. Stop right there. Testimony. Testimony is a declaration. It could be a declaration about anything. Testimony about anything. If you've ever been a witness in a court or seen it on TV, would you place your hand in the Bible, raise your right hand, you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. So help you, God? Yes, I do. Okay, sit down. To testify, a witness does, be it civil, criminal, what they either saw or heard or experienced. This says their testimony. Listen, if you are here today, everyone here today, and you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, he is your your Savior, you have a testimony. It's personal to you. It's a proclamation, a declaration of who Christ is and what he's done for you. Not for anybody else. I mean, I've heard hundreds of testimonies in my life. They're all different. You don't have to embellish your testimony. Well, you know, I I was a serial killer and then I I heard about Jesus. (laughs) Well, that's nice but it's no more powerful than I was an eight-year-old girl and heard of the gospel from my parents. And one day, I, with my mom, I asked Jesus to be my savior. Both of them require God's grace. You don't need to sensationalize what God has done in your life Amen. and who Jesus Christ is to you. Now, your testimony, if you have one, you need to be able to give it very briefly. You don't need to tell somebody, what well, you got an hour so we can talk. I mean, you might not have an hour. You might have one minute. And you need to be able to tell what Jesus has done in your life. I grew up in a religious home. Went to religious school for 12 years. I always believed in God. Do you think that I believe that Jesus was God? Probably. But it didn't matter to me. Went to college. One night, two friends of mine came, and I heard them tell me about who Jesus Christ was and what he had done. That he had died for my sins. He had died in my place. I never heard that before. If I did, I didn't remember it. I didn't have to be convinced I was a sinner. I already knew that. That message resonated with me. A couple of weeks later, I asked Christ to be my Savior. My life was changed immediately. There was a peace and a joy there. My behavior changed. My attitudes began to change. My motivations began to change. God is still changing me. I've got a long way to go. But he's done a great work in my life. And you know, when I die, I know I'm going to heaven. What, you, know, you think you're better than me? No, I'm not better than you. I'm probably 100 times worse. 
but I know not because anything I've done, not because I, I'm a pastor, not because I go to church, but it's because of Jesus and Jesus alone. He paid the penalty for my sins, and now I have eternal life. Amen. Testimony. Now, depends on who you're talking to, where you are. You might have a lot more time to fill in many more details. But the point is it's personal to you. God gives a testimony to us, and we testify to the world. 1 John 5, John who wrote Revelation 10, 11. Whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar because he's not believed in the testimony that God has concerned his Son. And this is the testimony. This is what God says, the declaration, that God gives us eternal life and his Son and in and this life is in the Son. So you could speak authoritatively. Nobody can say, well, that didn't really happen to you. You're just making that up. Well, I can say that, but you know better. So just the idea that you have a testimony that God changed you from light to darkness, from death to life. You now have a testimony, and you can speak authoritatively from your own personal experience. These men are witnesses right here. And it says, and when they had finished, these two men were immortal and immune until God had called them home. There's an old saying that says this, the man of God in the will of God is immortal until he has finished the work God has given him to do. You are immortal. Until God says, okay, your time on earth, my work in you is finished. My ministry with you is finished. Some of you say, well, 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 I don't have a ministry. Oh, yeah. If you're here this morning and Jesus Christ is your Savior, you have a ministry. Well, what do you mean? I don't get up and preach to people. I don't lead Bible studies. doesn't matter. It's not the size of a ministry. It's the faithfulness in your ministry, whether you're speaking to one person or thousands of people. Your ministry was wherever God has you as his witness. Witness, testifying to the grace of God in your life. Do you have a family? Do you have any friends, co-workers, fellow students? Yeah, I have all that. You live in a neighborhood? Yeah. Then you got a ministry. Size is not, it's not what matters. It's how you are doing. And so your ministry is wherever you are. So that means that you are a witness of what's going on in your life, whoever you're in front of. Now, a witness is something we are. A born-again believer is a new person in Christ, changed life, sin washed away, eternal life. God's transforming you. Every person who knows Christ is a witness. And now, giving your testimony is what a witness does. Let me tell you about it. Let me tell you what happened to me, how it happened. What I saw, what I heard, what I experienced, what Jesus did in my life. So you are a witness every day. The question is, what are you testifying to? That's the key. If you're a believer, the people know that. Okay, too personal here. Let's go to the next end of, the, end of verse 7. The beast that comes out of the abyss will make war with them. The beast is the first of 36 references in the book of Revelation, and it's the emphasis on his origins, out of the abyss. We saw that earlier in uh, Revelation chapter 9. The abyss is a, is a place of confinement for certain demons. Uh, this is not Satan, but this is a man empowered by Satan. Uh, we call him the Antichrist, the lawless one, whatever you want to call him, the beast. We'll see more, uh, more about it in chapter 13. And he, he, he tries to imitate Christ. He demands to be worshipped. And he's energized by Satan himself. So we'll see more about him in the future. Verse 7, And overcame them and killed them. And their dead bodies will lie in the streets of the great city, which mystically is called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. 
These two men will be killed, and they will be treated like dead animals. They'll be treated, you know, an animal gets hit in the street. Usually somebody comes along with the city or the parish or whatever and gets them off the street. They won't even be done that. They'll be lying in the street for three and a half days. And where will they be lying? Jerusalem, the great city. The holy city will be no better than any other city in the world. Sodom and Gomorrah, I mean Sodom and Egypt, figuratively for their apostasy and their rejection of God, depicting depravity and worldliness. So here we see a, just like when Jesus died, the forces of evil were triumphant. We did it. We got rid of this one who has the power over us. But then three days later, he burst forth from the tomb. Same with these two. Temporary victory. Darkness over light. Satan over God. Evil over righteousness. But God's not finished with him yet. Verse 9. Those from the peoples and tribes and tongues and nations will look at their dead bodies for three and a half days and will not permit their de dead bodies to be laid in a tomb. Everybody in the world will see this. Now, we know this because of mass communication, but think back. A hundred years ago, we couldn't say this. But now, something's happened in the other part of the world. You go and put your TV on and watch it live. So everybody's going to see this, the whole world. And look what they're going to do, verse 10. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and celebrate. And they will send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. Those who dwell on the earth are unsaved. We see that throughout the book of Revelation because the believer, our citizenship is in heaven. And what's going to take place here over the joy over these two witnesses dead in the street in Jerusalem, there's going to be the satanic Christmas. People are going to be sending gifts to each other. Yay, we got rid of them. They're gone. Yes, let's celebrate. Wow. Pretty dark. But again, God's not finished yet. Their resuscitation, verse 11. But after three and a half days, the breath of life from God came into them, and they stood on their feet, and great fear fell upon those who were watching them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. Then they went up to heaven in the cloud, and the enemies watched them. To resuscitate, to revive, especially when somebody is apparently deaf or unconscious. For three and a half days, they are dead, folks. They're not just swooning or, you know, deep sleep. They're dead. And the world knows it, and they are applauding this. But now, the world's great joy turns to great fear. This voice says, come up here. Probably the same voice that called John into heaven in Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. Come up here. They're going to be translated up into heaven at this point. Verse 13. And in that hour there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake, and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. Now this word for people right here is an interesting word. It's not your normal Greek word for people. It's the idea, literally it means names of men. In other words, names you would know, you know, more of a household name. You know, if you said some, you know, Taylor Swift, oh, yeah, we know her. You know, people know these names. So this unusual phrase probably indicates that these 7,000 who died were well-known members probably of Antichrist government. They were probably leaders in the community that everybody knew who they were. But it says the rest were terrified and gave glory to God of heaven. The rest. The inhabitants there of Jerusalem. I believe these are Jews right here who will come to faith in Christ because of what takes place. Why do I say that? Because to give glory to God is an act of true repentance and faith. You don't give glory to God truly unless you know him. So we see 144 witnesses, Revelation 7. We see two witnesses here in Revelation 11. Revelation 14, verse 6, And I saw another angel flying in mid heaven, having an eternal gospel to preach to those who live on earth and to every nation and tribe and tongue and people. 
God's going to have 144 plus 2 plus an angel flying around heaven. Doing what? What are they all doing? Verse 7. The angel said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory because the hour of judgment is come and worship him who made the heaven and the earth and sea and springs of water. The message is all the same. Fear God. Turn from your sins. Turn to Christ. He's coming back. Listen, I've said this many times. As terrible as the book of Revelation is, and it's terrible, God's wrath being poured out. But even in God's wrath, he always remembers mercy. He's still right here, all this judgment going on. He has people calling others, witnesses, turn. Come to Christ. It's not too late. Then verse 14 ends, the second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming. The seventh trumpet, the third woe will come soon, bringing in the final bold judgments, which will usher in Christ's return to earth and set up his kingdom. And it says, <coughs> excuse me, quickly, that it expresses the nearness of this last woe. When it takes place, it's going to happen very, very quickly. So, what an amazing, Two amazing people these guys are. And here's the main thing. God always has a witness in the world. He does right now. That witness is the church. So God calls us to be a witness. Jesus in Acts chapter 1, before he ascended into heaven, verse 8, he's talking to the apostles. He says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. Here Jesus says, church, this message that you heard, go tell everybody. And Acts chapter 1 verse 8 becomes the the table of contents for the rest of the book of Acts. They started in Jerusalem, they went to Judea and Samaria, and they went to the other most parts of the earth. And that message is still for us today. We're still to be God's witnesses in this world, throughout the world. David Guzik said this, if we will be witnesses, we must first have something to witness. Our own personal encounter with Jesus Christ, our own repentance, then we must have the power of the Holy Spirit to tell the story of what we've witnessed, the change of our life. So, what does it take to be a witness? First, your own personal encounter with Jesus Christ. Now, let me say something. I've said this before. Let me say it again because it needs to be repeated. Not everybody knows exactly when that took place. It's okay. You don't have to know the exact day, time, place. But the key is, has there been a change of life? That's the key. So you you must have your own testimony. At some point, I don't know when it was, maybe you do, maybe you don't, but I turned from sin and I trusted Jesus as my personal Savior. He's the only way of salvation. Not my baptism, not my church membership, not my good deeds. Jesus and Jesus alone, that's got to be part of your testimony, whether you know the exact time or not. And it's the gospel. It's around the gospel, the good news, the good news about the person and work of Jesus, who Jesus was and what did he come to do. Jesus was the second person of the Trinity. Jesus was eternal God who willingly left heaven and took upon humanity, fully God, fully man, the perfect God-man. Lived a sinless life the whole time he was here. Went to death on a cross, the the just dying for the unjust willingly. Three days later, he came out of the tomb to prove that he just wasn't another dead person. But he had power over sin and death and Satan for all times. And now, that same Jesus saved me. I was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. So the first thing is your personal encounter, your testimony with the Lord Jesus Christ. Second, in the power of the Holy Spirit. 
Every person who's born again, the Holy Spirit now lives within you. No exceptions. He's the down payment in your life that you are now God's possession, that one day he will, he will call you to, to himself and you'll have the full possession then. Because of that, every believer now has a power source within him, the Holy Spirit. Every Christian is packed with spiritual dynamite deep down inside themselves. So the question is, how do I now turn this power source on? If that's true, how do I get it working? Paul says in Ephesians 5.18, Do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Here's the key. The Spirit of God is in your life, but He needs to be influencing your life, controlling your life as you yield yourself to Him. To be filled is the idea of being controlled by. He says, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Why does he use this? Everybody knows what somebody's like when they're drunk with wine, right? That wine is controlling them, the way they talk, the way they walk, the way they're acting. So too, when the Spirit's controlling you, it affects how you talk, how you walk, how you're acting. That same word, to be filled with the Spirit, in 5.18 is found in other passages. They were filled with rage. They were filled with anger. They were filled with sorrow. So Paul says, it's one thing to possess the Holy Spirit. It's something else to allow your life to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. Now, to be controlled, to be filled by the Holy Spirit, is that some feeling you need to have? Like a little shiver up your spine? A little tingling? No. That's not what it is. Well, how do you get it then? You get it from the Word of God. Ephesians 5 and Colossians 3 are parallel passages. Ephesians 5 says, be filled with the Spirit. 18, Colossians 3, 16 said, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Same thing. Why do I know that? Why do we know that? Because the outcome in Ephesians 5 and Colossians 3 are the same, same thing that comes out of your life. They parallel each other. So both the Spirit and the Word have the same effect. When you're in the Word, the Spirit is involved there because the Spirit wrote the Word of God. John MacArthur said this. That means to be preoccupied with the presence of Jesus Christ. How do you get preoccupied with the presence of Jesus? You see this book? This tells you about Him. Get into it. And the more you are in here, the more saturated you are with Jesus Christ. The more saturated you are with Jesus Christ, the more he controls your thoughts. The more he controls your thoughts, the more you're filled with the Spirit. And let me add this to it. Because we're talking about be a witness. The more he filled with the Spirit, the more you want to become a witness. The things that you talk about, the things that you do, are what matters to you. What you put your time, your talent your money into, those things matter to you. And those things that you put inside of yourself come out of you. You can't stop it, folks. You can't be somebody you're not. So the more we put the word in us, the more it's going to come out. There's this group, I came across this study, the Center for Bible Engagement, and they came up with this discovery. They did a bunch of um, tests, you know, what do you call them? Surveys. And here's what they came up with. They found this. For a a Christian who is engaged with the Scripture, excuse me, at least four times a week, they look radically different from the life of someone who does not. They also found that those who claim to be a Christian who don't ever come to the Word, do not engage with the Bible, most of the days of the week they look no different than the non-believer. They call this engagement four times a week with the Scripture the power of four. Here's what they found. If you have the power of four, it impacts how you live your life. 47% of people get less likely to get drunk. 68% of people are less likely to have sex outside of marriage. 61% of people are less likely to look at pornography. 74% of people are less likely to gamble. But listen to this. The power of four on your testimony The person who has the power of four who comes to the Scripture four more times a week, 
228% more likely to share their faith with others. Wow, that's staggering. Well, why is that? Well, here's what I think. What goes in comes out. Junk in, junk out. You put good stuff in, you put the word in, but God's working in your life, you want to tell people about it. It's just natural. You're excited about it. There's a joy that's there. Listen, the best training for evangelism, and we do that around here every now and then, which, we, you know, which is good, is of little effectiveness, I don't care how it is, without the filling of the Holy Spirit, without desiring to walk with God without desiring to tell other people about that. And because of that, I can be a witness and I can tell people about the hope that is within me. God is never without a witness. Today, we are God's witness. Every one of you are first stringers. None of you are on the bench. There is no bench. And I close with this, if I could put it in these terms. Every one of us are beggars. And being a beggar, we want to tell other beggars where to find bread, where there's food. I found spiritual food in Jesus, the bread of life. Now, I want to go tell others. Let's pray. Father, everybody in here who knows Jesus, someone witnessed to them. Probably more than just one. Maybe a, who knows how many people. Might have taken weeks, years. But if we've all had somebody witness to us. And now, because of knowing the good news of salvation, of Christ dying for my sins and giving me eternal life, I pray that we might desire to, when the opportunity comes, to tell others of the spiritual dynamite that we have. And Doing so, we might not always be liked. We've got to count the cost there. Some people might even reject us, think that we're, we're fools. It's okay to be a fool for God. Others might not want to talk to us, and that is hurtful. But in the end, the message that we have is far greater than any difficulties we might encounter. So I pray for all of us as we leave here today that we might be a witness for Christ. In his name I pray, amen.